because it is a very, very risky sort of business in a way, if you don't know what you're doing. So what is knowing what you're doing? Like, what are you looking for? Is it purely an intuitive process? Is it understanding who your clients are and understanding what, what their desires are and looking at products that meet that? Like, how does, how, how did, how, how was your decision-making process back then? Especially when you started, when people haven't developed a lot of experience. Right. Um, it's, well, everything can be risky. You could buy something for $100,000 and then you find out it's fake or, you know, you could buy a big collection and there's only a couple good pieces and then you don't know what to do with the rest of it. Um, but when I look at a, a large collection or a museum or whatever, I automatically I'm looking at it because there's like X amount of pieces that I know immediately what to do with. And maybe the rest of it I can figure out further on down the line. I'll give you a good example. Um, in April, I purchased probably the largest collection I've ever purchased in my whole entire career. It was about a thousand pieces, maybe a little bit more. Jeez. And I knew the person had passed away and I ended up working at a deal with the family and I, I purchased everything uh, right down to the toilet paper rolls. And it was a mixture of incredibly good stuff mixed with stuff that wasn't so great. And I'm still in the process of dealing with it. But immediately I sold the stuff that I knew I had a client base for. I kept the stuff that I knew I would never want to get rid of. And then I figured out what I was going to do with the other stuff later on down the line. And now I just recently opened up a pop-up shop in Connecticut, uh, not too far from where I live. And it's been great. All that stuff I didn't really know what to do with ended up in there. So that fulfills uh, a certain need for like the people around here. It's larger things I can never ship. Right. The really rare and expensive stuff I kind of have sort of like in my own collection or I'll, you know, make a TV show on a couple of the items in the future, whatever I want to do with it. I also, I didn't mention, like I lived in Brooklyn for 20 something years and moving to Connecticut gave me a tremendous amount of space, which is like, it's good. It's bad. It's, it's probably bad because I can just keep collecting constantly and I'll fill these buildings up. We have three buildings on our property. Um, but it's great when I buy a huge collection like that, everything can go in there and I can slowly figure out what to do with it kind of later on. Wow. And has that thought process, because I'm guessing, as you said, now it's, it's, it's a mixture of knowing how to identify value, understanding what your what's what your clients want and what they don't want. But what about when you were starting and you didn't have clients? Like how was, how are you processing that decision-making process? I always seem to have clients. So I remember some of my earliest memories in New York city. When I first moved there, I was already buying stuff and I knew every single antique store in my general area. And back in, I guess when I was 18, I'm 41. Now there was flea markets everywhere. There was antique stores all over the city. I mean, you go to like Chinatown and there would be um, a shop that sold like pots and pans. And then you go down into the basement. It was just filled with the craziest stuff you've ever seen. Uh, those days are unfortunately gone. But I always had, I guess, the know-how or talent to be able to flip something and make money off of it. Um, I did that. I remember being like 19 or 20 and I had purchased some, um, some human skulls actually from a flea market. I got them really cheap and ended up just going into each tattoo shop that I could find at the time and being like, Hey guys, I have these human skulls. This is how much they are. And I made a, a bunch of money and then it, it allowed me to purchase some more stuff. And then I started building up my stock and then it just sort of like naturally uh, progressed from there. So yeah, I've always been doing it for some reason. I was doing it when I was in, you know, from like 13 on. Yeah. It's interesting, right? Like as, as you, as you've grown it and it's, in its essence, you're still doing the same thing that you were doing at 18, just at a different scale. Yeah, because I uh, I was collecting guitars when I was, I think after my baseball card phase, I started to move into guitars and uh, musical equipment. And I remember like one of my first guitars was a Gibson Les Paul Custom from 1988. And it was a beautiful, beautiful guitar. But I only bought it because I said, all right, I'm over the baseball cards. Let me sell these things when they're hot. Because now, you know, like, most of them aren't worth anything. People throw them out at the dump all the time. Um, but I was smart. I got in right before they started to tank. So I sold them at a good profit. And then it sort of fueled my next um, fascination, which was guitars and stuff. So I remember at, at one point after all that, I had like, you know, 15 guitars at like the age of 15 or something. That's a, that's any 15 year, any 15 year old's dream if I've ever heard it. Yeah. 
Have but it wasn't like someone bought well. them for me. Like I, yeah, yeah, I bought them myself. I just figured out a way to do it somehow. Wow. You see, you've always, and, and, and it's interesting because I guess you've always sort of kind of had that. And that's why I'm, I'm very, because to, to you, my, my, what look for you, something that might seem like a completely natural way of thinking, natural way of making decisions for somebody else that doesn't really understand it. It's something that, you know, they, they can't even process. So at that age to be able to spot not only the opportunity and real value and then and, and no way to do it. And also the timing is something that, you know, a lot of people don't understand, for example, timing, which is a very, I'm guessing a very crucial part of what you do. Sure. Um, how is it also intuitive? Is it, or do, or do you look at what's happening socially, politically to sort of understand what's going on in the world and how does that relates to specific products? Like how does, sure. how, how do you go through that, that thought process? Oh, no, you need to know what's going on in the world. You need to know your clientele base and you need to know your products. And luckily for me, I'm still to this day absolutely obsessed with what I do. Um, so it's not work. So in my spare time, I'm either working down in my studio, restoring something or, you know, fixing something up or cleaning something. Otherwise, I'm researching, I'm reading, I'm looking at auctions, I'm scouring the internet for information about different things. Am I going to buy this thing based on what I know about it? Am I going to take a risk? Am I not? So you, you really, it's the more, you know, the better, you know. Mm, interesting. And I'm guessing the amount of risk that you decide taking is relative to the item and the moment, right? Yeah. Like it's really up to you. Yeah, yeah. But you know, the thing in my business is if you don't buy it, someone else will. Mm. So I might see something and yeah, maybe I'm not going to keep it or I'm not going to do anything with it but it might be like a little bit too expensive. I don't know what I'm going to do, but if I don't buy that piece. Someone else is going to buy it and then they're going to do something with it. So my thought process often is get it and figure out what to do with it later or, you know, buy it, sell it. You know, it's just this constant thing that goes on in, in, in my head, I guess. Awesome. And when it comes to your decision-making way of, of just making professional and creative decisions as well, would you say you're more rational and logical when it comes to that? Or are you more intuitive, creatively based? Uh, it's almost like, because from, from what you've said, I can tell you're, you're like a very th thin balance between, you know, a creative, an artist, but also a business person. So I'm trying to understand what do you think dominates that, that aspect of, of, okay. of your life and business? I don't know. <clears throat> I do know that, you know, for instance, when I'm doing the Oddities Flea Market, um, and I love doing them. It's it's a great community that we put together through the market. But I know if there's a certain period of time where I'm not being artistic, I kind of break down. Or if I'm not doing what it is that I, I love doing, which is, you know, going out and like, we I used to travel the world doing this stuff. And clearly, because of the pandemic, it's, it's put a little bit of a hold on that. Um, let's hope that we can go back to doing some of that stuff. But I sort of like, I start to lose... Um, what is it that I'm trying to say? Yeah, you feel like asphyxiated. I, yeah, something like that. I start to like kind of break down. So I always need to do do something creative. Um, that's a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. And the cool part about antiques is that you're sort of always doing something to them. Now, oftentimes you can buy a collection and you just buy it and then you sell it or you buy it and you stick it on your, your shelf. But oftentimes it needs something. It needs a cleaning. There's like this personal touch when you purchase something that's one of a kind that almost makes it yours. You're putting a piece of your soul into it to a certain degree. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's almost in of itself. It's, I mean, it's an adventure. It's a little adventure in a little store. You're trying it's, it's almost, it's funny to think that in a way it's almost like the continuous search for that, that purpose. You can find that purpose inside a, a store in a, in a, in a dark corner in a store in, in you know, in, in New Jersey or in a store in, in Madrid, you're just constantly with that. It's almost like like you're on your own sort of um, almost like movie journey, just traveling the world, looking for things that you enjoy. Yeah. And that's I mean, the you, you know, the first thing I'm doing when <laughs> we go to like a new country or something, where's the antique markets? <laughs> you know, where's the antique stores? Um, and that's what I'm always oh, and that. And, you know, like I love the historical value of a lot of these older places like in right. Europe, for instance, where we used to go. Um, on a regular basis. So I think we're supposed to go to Spain in April. So let's hope that still happens. 
Awesome. And which place so far has been the one that has captivated you the most? And I don't want to, not from a touristic perspective, like looking at it and just like a tourist, but from yep. the perspective of, of a collector, which place it could be as specific as a CD and a place that you've been through. You were like, wow, this, this is something about this place is truly unique. Uh, well, I'll just say Italy in general, right. um, but specifically in Italy, Bologna and Florence were great places to uh, find the type of things that I'm interested in. And then mm -hmm. uh, my wife was working in Paris a lot. And so I would just tag along with her and I was finding incredible stuff there. So she'd be working and I would just be gallivanting around um, St. Germain uh, going to all the antique stores there. And I was finding the, the best stuff I've ever seen. Awesome. And uh, why do you think that is? Because you said New York, that's sort of just not the thing anymore. Is it because people have like cultural differences, people in Europe seem to value aesthetics a lot more. Like, what do you think the reason for that is? They have an older heritage, um, right. <clears throat> Europe in general. In, yeah. uh, you know, I, I didn't know why the New York doesn't work anymore. The rents are too expensive. I mean, New York in general, I think is the most expensive state in the whole country. Um, I think, I don't know if that's true or not, but it, it basically forced all the antique stores out of business. Nobody could afford the rents anymore. And the flea markets turned to skyscrapers and they just started, they evaporated over the years. I mean, it's, it's one of the large reasons why we ended up moving out. Not the only reason I'd been looking to leave for some time, but it just started to go away and I wasn't finding anything. And I found myself going to places like Connecticut. And even when I travel to California, I'm finding more pieces out there than I'm finding um, in New York. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And when it comes to uh to scale again was it always something that was very progressive from a business perspective like as i said more clients more products better products this retail location or this this store or this market then more clients more products repeat the process and scale it progressively or was it was there something particular that that sort of got everything the momentum truly truly going i don't know i think the momentum always was there I think there's just been, you know, different choices and decisions I made that maybe like put it forward to a certain, you know, higher extent. If that makes what, any sense. Which which decisions were those? Well, I might I might have come across like a huge collection or something, and that catapulted me into like a totally different direction, or you know, like the wax collection that I was talking about. That's at House of Wax. Mm -hmm. I never really had any amazing wax pieces, and then suddenly I have like 175 of them. So then I have a fascination in that. So, you know, as you progress as a collector, you might get one piece, which then makes you fascinated in that, that sub genre uh, to where you're obsessing over that and you're learning about that stuff constantly. So. Okay. Interesting. And when it comes to uh, the, the clients, is it usually because I don't, I don't, and I come from a, from a business background. So I'm also very, very interesting in this. Uh, when it comes to the clients, is it mostly, is it a model based on few, very, very good clients or a lot of clients? Is it volume or um, quality? Mostly. No, I mean, we, we have quite a lot of clients. Uh, we were doing these live auctions on Saturdays throughout the whole pandemic. And we just did that because all of our events were shut down for, you know, COVID. Right. Uh, we, we picked those up again. So we haven't been doing the auctions as much, but we did them every single Saturday and we we're like, Oh, this would be fun. Maybe a few people will show up and we had great success in doing them. Um, because for the first time we were offering items to everybody in the country, we we're doing any like overseas shipping. Uh, cause it's just a little difficult, but it was great. It sort of put together this new community. It opened up our audience base because if you think about it, like we were doing the New York oddities flea market. We we're doing the Los Angeles oddities flea market. Uh, and only really the people in those general areas can attend those. So if you lived in like the Midwest, you couldn't really purchase from that market. Right. Um, so I think your question was like, what's our, our general audience? I think it really runs the gamut. It could be someone who's just starting out collecting to, you know, a huge collector or, you know, just someone that wants something for aesthetics or someone that wants something that's educational. Uh, it's really all over the place. Right. But when you started out, I'm guessing you eventually transitioned to that more diversified customer base. When you were starting out, I'm guessing it was more about finding good customers and then progressively expanding to that. Yeah. 
Or was also <laughs> was it also a mix from the very very beginning? You were throwing events, you were you were building communities, or you were just oh okay, okay I have this client that I have a really good relationship. He introduced me to another guy, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah, you always have your good clients, and it, it used to be a lot different, you know, before the internet age, right. where yeah, your clients right. you hold those really really close to you. You don't ever tell anyone who you're selling to, you know. Those were like and, and your sources, the people you were getting stuff from on a, a, a permanent basis. Um, or regular basis, I should say. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it was probably a little bit more finite back then. Um, it's a little bit different now. If I have a really good piece, you can just post it on online and then people come to you, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, yeah, you had to have like a Rolodex, literally <laughs> like an actual <laughs> Rolodex of your really good people uh, that if you got a, an incredibly high end piece, that's who you would go to first. Yeah, I mean, I'm what celebrities or people that were highly fanatical about art and the, the work specifically, right? Like, how do I go? Like, really, really loyal customers. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And <clears throat> what about risks, though? Have you ever made like a really, really? Because I'm, I, I, I have this intuitive feeling that most the thing that probably stops a lot of people from getting into collection is, you know, this idea of it being very, very high risk. You know, as you said, if you don't know what you're doing or if you don't have specific natural strengths or talents. So uh, what just for the sake of being it, making it more relatable, I guess. Uh, yeah. what, what about some like big, big, big failures, things that you like completely <laughs> screwed over? Yeah, I remember um, I thought it was a great idea after the the show oddities. I, I used some of the money and I bought this uh, amazing 1955 Ford Thunderbird. I was like, oh, it's going to be great. You know, um, I'll, I'll be riding around in this thing. It looks like the Batmobile. It's convertible. It's the coolest looking thing I've ever seen. And it still kind of fell into um, my wheelhouse because it was, you know, vintage antique. Uh, but I never owned a vintage car and it was it wasn't cheap. It wasn't a huge it wasn't a huge investment. But I remember purchasing that and then oh, no, now I need to do something to the engine. Yeah. Oh, shit, now I need to yeah, change yeah. the wheels or whatever. Yeah. And I ended up putting so much money. I remember one time it caught on fire. And all I did was dr I, I drove it and parked it. And suddenly <laughs> my neighbor's knocking on my door saying, hey, your car's smoking. So I probably lost a lot of money on that car. Um, it was fun while it lasted. But yeah, I'd say that was probably one of my bigger fails. Awesome. And I do want to ask you a lot of business-related questions because, I mean, I highly, highly admire and respect, obviously, your your creative curation abilities. But I mean, there's very, very few people that have managed to pull off what you've been able to pull off from a business perspective. And I, I truly believe that as a as a creative admirer, there's very, very few information on that part of the industry, which is very, very mm -hmm. scary for a lot of people. Um, so that's why I'm asking you a lot of questions from that. end. I do want to get into sort of like the creative aspect of it later on. Uh, yeah, but what about, what would you say were the most pivotal moments or events in your career? Would you say the TV show was one of them or was there, was there multiple? Well, yeah, I'd say the TV show was like really kind of catapulted what I do to a totally different level, but I've always been really lucky. I, I don't know what it is. I've always been able to kind of like spot something before it's really cool. Um, I, I'm not saying I invented oddities. I, I clearly did not. And before the show oddities, there was plenty of people that were doing it on a grand scale, but I was always like collecting something right before it blew up. And then sometimes when something blows up, it takes the value down or it could make the value go way up because it becomes a lot more scarce. Of course. Um, but I would say that's one of like the, the most pivotal or like the most essential parts to my career. It's just been like luck of the drawer. Mm -hmm. Which yeah, not everybody in. has. Like there is a thought process. Listen, like every move that I make, I, I do think about. Um, I'm not precarious with with my decision making, but I think I've been doing it long enough, and I've, I've been through pretty much every situation that one could be in uh, in business, and I've somehow like managed to remain on top. Yeah, not on wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. And if you could rationalize the thought process that. I know I understand that a lot of it has been timing, uh, but if you could rationalize what your thought process throughout that, those times, how would you how would you describe it? What do you mean? 
uh, as in you said you 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 were usually at the right moment, things were at the right time. You usually, were able to spot things before they went viral or or mainstream or whatever. Uh, how would you rationalize that thought process now? Look, because you said that there is there is a process. Like it's not you're you're not just like winging it. Uh, you said you have been you have gotten lucky, but this, still there's 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 a there's a calculated. Uh, way of making decisions, even through things that might seem superficial, like luck, you know, something like timing. So how, right. how do you sort of think about uh, how to spot things if they're at the right time, if they're not the right <clears throat> time? I'm just, uh, I do know that one of the things that I always think about is being like quick witted. Mm -hmm. You've got like it, quick witted, meaning like you have a very short window to make a decision when it comes to my business in particular. Um, you know, someone might offer you something and if you snooze on it, you might snooze on it an extra 10 minutes and guess what? It sold to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it might've just come down to like, you, you didn't want to cough up an extra thousand dollars or something. And that thousand dollars is what made you lose, you know, like a five or $10,000 deal. It's happened to me a ton. I mean, the other part of it is, you know, like exposing what you do can be troublesome because it makes it popular and it makes it a lot harder to operate. So it's a lot harder to operate now than it was when I was 18 years old and nobody really cared about this stuff except for, you know, my community of people. What what do you mean when you say it's it's hard it's harder than it was harder? Just before. like finding product, you know, right, like okay. everything is so easily accessible today. All you have to do if you you're looking for, you know, like this painting or a skull or whatever, He's going on like an auction site and chances are you might be able to find something in that realm. Um, but the prices are so in like inflated at this point because it's so easy to just go on this page. I can buy it before you had to like scour the world to find this stuff. So it was kind of up to you to do it. Right. But that made, that made the, the antique more valuable, right? It's just basic economics, supply and demand. Right. I just remember when eBay came out, it was sort of put, put a stake through the heart of of that world because suddenly <laughs> everybody could list something you could buy it you knew what the price was there was people at the flea market like you know putting something out and then going on ebay and going oh shit this sold for blah 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 well, i'm gonna mark it up now right right you know the same thing with the tv show you know that exposed the market to a certain degree and it kind of gave everybody that insight that you didn't know you really didn't know about it prior Mm -hmm. Okay. And how did the TV show change the economical dynamics of your industry? Did it make uh, products harder to get? Was it everything you was what you were doing just amplified a thousandfold more customers, more access both. to more people? How did it, everything? Yeah, it, it, it was both. You know, it, it was great because it exposed this, um, this world that most people didn't even know existed. So I think it gave a lot of people the... Um, like catapulted people into like a different, different world. Like, Oh, cool. I can buy this stuff. And there's other people that like it. So it sort of exploded mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as a result, which of course, in turn made it much harder to find the things that I had been buying like my whole life. But it also helped my career because I then became one of the go-to people to buy this stuff. So, it, you know, it was a double-edged sword. Right. So it was great from a branding and marketing perspective, yes, but absolutely. it wasn't so great from, an, how can we say it from a, I guess, product development perspective, because more people were getting into it, more people were buying, more people wanted to become now this and now <clears throat> sort of the, the, the supply of good antiques decreased. Yeah, I guess it was just a matter of time, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And it happens. I mean, every every single industry is cyclical, especially industries that go through ups and downs, like like the antique industry, I'm guessing. Uh what about has has have you always mostly worked based on stores and sort of retail locations and you know the, the market model, or has it have you flipped now into something that's more e-commerce? How because I'm guessing that was also a pretty, pretty big transition for your business model, especially when you're dealing with you know precious objects that you can just you can't just send them over and you know in a DHL, I'm guessing. Uh yeah, and I actually I I've only I very rarely have had a retail store. We we're in like a an antique center right now. So there's other dealers, so it's not my own shop. Um but it's great. It's a lot less pressure. You know, someone else sells my stuff for me. I don't really, I stick it in there and it sells cool if it doesn't, whatever. 
Um, but I've always, for the most part, sold privately. That's always been the easiest thing. You know, the internet made it a lot easier with the invention of social media. Um, you know, especially at the beginning of social media, I would just put something up in a story or on my page and it would sell like, sometimes it would sell within seconds. It was great. Um, you know, now things have changed on social media, even algorithms are a lot more difficult to deal with. And it, it's definitely a good tool to use, but you know, you have to know how to use it uh, to your benefit. Of course. And do you still handle all those transactions yourself or your team pretty much? Yeah, we have a team. We have a team, but I, I do do a lot of it myself. Of course. Yeah. But I'm guessing you're, you're still, your biggest role is identifying potential going out there and finding truly unique pieces. I'm guessing that's pretty much what you do now, right? That's the part that only I can do. Yeah. Of course. That's, and that's, that's the part I enjoy doing it, but it's the part that really like my wife, Regina does some of that, but she's mostly the back end. Um, I think my eyes are probably my best asset, my, my knowledge of things. Yeah. Because you can see something. I, I've I've purchased fake pieces before by accident. I thought they were real. I thought they were like, you know, X amount of age. And I then come to find out, guess what? That's a reproduction or, you know, it's this or it's it's something else. So even, you know, once again, not patting myself on the back, but the most seasoned collector or dealer um, can get had sometimes. I mean, it happens to the best of us. Right. Yeah. But I can imagine it's something that it's almost impossible to tell, to delegate. I mean, you'd have to, uh, you have to delegate to it to somebody that's been working for you or that you trust completely. And that is, I mean, that's, that takes decades if it ever happens, sure. you know? Okay. And did you ever get in like, like in the position where you got sort of lost in the management aspect of it? Cause I'm guessing that can also be very, very <laughs> common, like, right? Yeah. I feel like every week I get lost in the management, but, um, no, um, I don't know. Can you explain that a little bit more? So sure. So I mean, it's it's very easy, right? Uh, when you start growing, so when something starts growing, like at the very beginning, it's it's simple, right? It's oh, I like I like pretty things. I go out yeah, there, no I spot pretty things, I resell them, and I keep yep. some of them. Simple. But then, oh, more people want more pretty things. Now I have to go out there and get a hundred pretty things. And now I have to hire three people and now I don't have enough customers to get all these three things. So I have to like your focus, your focus starts going all over the place. And it's very easy to lose yourself in that process. Right. Because you forget yeah, that you, you're, you forget that the most important thing about what you do is you need to be finding incredible things, not focusing on hiring all the time or focusing on how do you market this or sell this, uh, it's very easy to lose yourself in that process, especially when you work at the scale that you're working now or at the, at, the, at the level of growth that you had. If you enjoy this episode and you want to directly support our podcast, make sure you check out the links in the description.